Talk Recorded live. Good evening, everybody. This is Jörg Lissmann again from the YouTube channel Juggler66, and I welcome all the listeners and all the viewers of the video later on made to another show of Hour of the Truth. We have today, Thursday, the 28th of May, 2015, and we will be dealing again with a reading of the booklets that um, Walt put together that originally comes from a 50, 50, 55 pages small booklet that is called the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. And it is a conspiracy. It is not a conspiracy theory. Let me assure you that. So I hope that you've enjoyed our latest broadcast where we were talking about this book and where we were digging deep into the hidden founding fathers, the three carols, John, Daniel, and Charles. And finally, after a few months, I got it to name them all three by heart. <laughs> I used to have problems with these three names, but anyway, not as many problems as people like Eric John Phelps, because they don't even have them in their vocabulary. Today, uh, of course, I am very glad to welcome again my good friend and brother in Christ, Walt Stickel, from the website Grand Design Exposed, who set this call up and who is joining me today in reading of the book, The Jesuits, uh, the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, which we will start right away after, of course, Walt introduced himself. So, Walt, how is the weather and everything else over there in Oregon, on the west coast of America? Welcome to the show. Hello? Okay, listen. You've got to open your mic, man. <laughs> yes, excuse me. Listen. Anyway, welcome to the southern coast of Oregon here on an overcast day on the shores of Romerica. You know, when you come to the mic and you share, I mean, this is public, so this is being, being recorded and can be shared with anybody. And so sometimes, you know, like the last week, the last five or six months when I was sharing about the carols, I didn't, re I didn't even make a broadcast for about five months because I was thinking, you know, is it really important? But I'll tell you what gives you a boost is when, when you get, uh, um, I got three emails yesterday. And the first one was said, hi, hi Walt. We really appreciate your ministry and are thankful for how God uses you to expose the truth. We encourage you to keep up the good work. God bless you. And then the next one, I got three yesterday. <laughs> I was kind of, it uh, really made my day. But the second one here, I want, a little com I want to do a little comment on it. It's uh, blessings in Jesus, Mr. Stickle. I've become aware of your work from the Hour of Truth show on YouTube. I also live in Oregon. I've just started listening to your blog talk show as well for the last couple days. Very interesting work. I just wanted to make a contact with you and say that thank you for your work. Also, to see how close you are to me in Oregon. I've been following the work of Eric John Phelps for four years or so now, and I found it interesting he doesn't speak of the Carroll family. At least that's what you said, and I can say I haven't heard him speak of them either. The main teaching I've learned, the main teaching I've learned is the true cause of the American Revolution. Your explanation very much resonates with me and makes much more sense than Eric's or the establishment's lie. The Jesuits cause this war makes a lot of sense. Also, isn't it interesting that the Illuminati was formed by the Jesuits in 1776 as well? And then the post-French revolutionary Illumina Illuminati fr France gives us the Masonic Jesuit Statue of Liberty. Also, if Washington was such a Christian as Eric states, along with Mormon Beck, then why did he oversee the layout and building of the mystery Babylon, Washington, D.C.? Hopefully we can make contact here, and I wanted to write and say I'm listening and I'm thankful for your work. 
for our Lord Jesus Christ. I know our main enemy is Satan, manifested most poignantly in the Vatican. God bless you and protect you and family in Jesus' name. Now, you know, I wanted to make a comment uh, because as we go through this broadcast, you know, as we center on this book, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, I want to mention Eric Phelps, not to uh, throw stones, because I, I listened at the beginning when I first started doing my research, I, I found it very, very interesting, some of the history that I learned from Eric Phelps. But we have to ask ourselves, like this listener did, why is, why is it that Eric Phelps, the vocab- in his vocabulary, the word carols is not there? Well, I think it relates back a lot to what I mentioned on last week's broadcast on the Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. Here's a 600-page book with every cult imaginable except one, and that is the Roman Catholic Church. Then this last week, it hit me again. I came across a, a video a YouTube video, and you can get there by going to The Marks of a Cult, A Biblical Analyst with Eric Holberg. Now, I listened to the first five or six minutes, and I said, you know, I'll bet you that this documentary will go on for an hour and 54 minutes and never mention Rome. Well, to make the statement that I'm, you know, to make the statement that I'm about to make, I had to watch it for an hour and 54 minutes. There wasn't, there wasn't a mention, not one mention of Rome, or the word Jesuit. The word Jesuit is not in their vocabulary. Now, what, what, what is the reason for this? What is Eric Phelps's position here? One, he's a futurist, okay? And, you know, after analyzing his sole purpose, this has to be answered, you see, because Eric, people that watch Eric Phelps and listen to this and say, well, you, you quoted Chris Pinto in that, The Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers. Well, you can see, you see, Eric Phelps calls Chris Pinto a Jesuit coagitator. And he would call us a Jesuit coagitator because we don't believe that George Washington was a Christian. You see, uh, our David Barton, now there's an army here, not to pick on one person, but there's a dividing line here. And this this is what I want to bring to the front. The dividing line is who founded America? Who founded America? And your Glissman right now, I want to say again, he is reading Rulers of Evil and doing a great job. It's a, it's a book that needs to be digested. And when you, when you by, and by the way, Tupper, Tupper Saucy is also a Jesuit coagitator by Eric Phelps. Now, 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 you can see what's happening here. The opposition, they control both sides. They always control both sides of, of, of a debate. And the reason for an 846-page book and leaves out the carols is to cover up the founding of America. What is David Barton's goal? What is his, what, 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 what is he, what is he, his, what's his agenda is to, is to cover up the real founding of America. Now, now listen, and I, I felt really very blessed with this email because this listener has just looking, because when, 
the last couple of weeks when we've been going over the carols, we were just putting the carols into our vocabulary and putting and inserting them into history. But it's real important to understand disinformation. History is history. Now, Eric Phelps causes Chris Pinto is a Jesuit coagitator. Tupper Saucy is a Jesuit coagitator. And the real Jesuit coagitator is Eric Phelps. The proof is in the pudding. If you're going to talk about the founding of America, you cannot leave the carols out of the equation. But am I telling you, am I telling you don't listen to Eric Phelps? No. You're going to get some good inside information because he's got inside information. He has been mentored by the Jesuits. You don't write an 846-page book with over 700 illustrations in it with not having some help. And the help comes from the Jesuits. Now, I'm not running Eric Phelps down because Eric Phelps will admit that he's been mentored. He's, he's even went to prophecy conferences dressed as a Jesuit. This is just reality. You see, in this postmodern world, evidence doesn't matter. But when you're, but when you're, when you're a child of God, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the truth, the only truth, evidence does matter. And the evidence, all you have to do, like this listener, is what was such a blessing. This listener has put the pieces together because all, all what's in this book that I put together, I didn't write it. It's like a Rubik's Cube. You remember the Rubik's Cube? Somebody challenged me years ago, Walt, you couldn't even put that Rubik's Cube together if you had the instructions to put it together. Well, I went through a check stand, and there was a little booklet for 50 cents. I bought the book and put the Rubik's Cube together. Now, to understand, to understand the, Amer the American Revolution, you have to have all the pieces of the puzzle. You have to have the right directions. You have to understand the Roman Catholic influence. And what in and so to put the and so what is happening I see and it's 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 exciting when somebody because don't follow Walt Stickle. Read this history. And it is important. I am glad but for the great I'm just, I'm just so thankful that there's a you know, there's only going to be a few of us they're going to. Are, are, it's only a few, but they're they're out there. They're out there. People understand this. Are understanding this once they put the word Jesuit into their in, into the equation, and that book. That book has the Jes word Jesuit in it 221 times. Now I want to read you one more email. He said, "My name." My name is Brett, and just wanted to respond to your kind request that you have made by email to be present on the call of an hour of truth. I currently work a busy schedule and can hardly able to participate on the scheduled times of the, of the show. I want you to know that you are doing a great service. I also want to inform you that I am grateful for your work with your website and the hour of truth on YouTube and look forward to each episode. If there is any way to tithe to support your ministry, I would be honored to do so. Please send, <clears throat> excuse me, please send me any information where I can send you a check or money order. Well, don't send any money to me, okay? But I appreciate, 
I appreciate. But what you can do, buy the truth and sell it not. You can go to Grand Design Exposed, go to the download book page, and download the PDF and the cover. Two PDF files. Go to your local printer, and you can have that book printed for three or four dollars. And matter of fact, in it, in, in if you have a if you have a, a a laser printer, you can print it yourself on the PDF in book form. It comes, it's in book form. So, so if you want to help the hour of the truth, our jugglers. Juggler 66, our Mystery Babylon News Radio, you can print a book and you can share it with somebody. So, but I really, I want to thank all three listeners for their kind words and encouragement. I really appreciate it. It made my day. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to York for, and we're going to, we're going to start uh, the Je- the Jesuits in history. Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you, Walt. And um, the advice that you just gave to Brett that would uh, be concluded by me to say that would be a very good way to spend some of these Fiat Federal Reserve notes instead of giving it to us. Um, even though that we are in need, we are not that desperate that we are going to take any money to support our broadcast right here. And um, <clears throat> but do that. Uh, go out there, print the book, and uh, don't sell it. <laughs> but just give it away to people who are, at least to your opinion, uh, spiritually honest and open for this kind of information. Anyway, before we go <clears throat> into the reading of the Vez- uh, Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy and the uh, uh, the paragraphs today called The Jesuits in History, I want to reflect a little bit to go back on the reading that I did on the book Rulers of Evil. And something in the context of the Jesuits in history, you have to understand, that is why this is very interesting, that I'm going to read to you a few quotes. They come from chapter 7 of the book Rulers of Evil, and that chapter 7 is called The Fingerstroke of God. And within a few minutes you will understand what is meant by the fingerstroke of God. The first little quote I want to read to you comes from page 46 of the book Rulers of Evil. Quote, Paul III, this is Pope Paul III, is a major figure in the history of the Society of Jesus and consequently of the United States of America, since it was he who approved in the summer of 1539 Ignatius de Loyola business plan. Continue on page 47, quote, they would infiltrate the world in an unpredictable variety of pursuits as doctors, lawyers, authors, reforming theologians, financiers, statesmen, courtiers, diplomats, explorers, tradesmen, merchants, poets, scholars, scientists, architects, engineers, artists, printers, philosophers, and whatever else the world might demand and the church require. In the constitutions which Ignatius was writing, the superior general would be, quote, obeyed and reverenced at all times as the one who holds the place of Christ our Lord, unquote. The phrase, holds the place of Christ, means that the superior general would share with the Pope at a level unperceived by the general public the divine title of Vicar of Christ, first claimed by Gelasius I on May 13, 495 AD. Loyola's completed constitutions would repeat 500 times that one is to see Christ in the person of the superior general. We must hold fast to the following principle. Quote, what seems to me white, I will believe black if the hierarchical church so defines. 
Francis Xavier, who was a co-founder with Ignatius of Loyola of the Society of Jesus, would later describe this quality of submission in a vow that unintentionally summarized the Jesuit mission, quote, I would not even believe the Gospels were the Holy Church to forbid it. Okay, then we go on page 48 and continue where there is the mentioning of the fourth O of induction, that the oath the Jesuits take when they are Jesuits at a very, very, very high level. The first Jesuits that were, uh, that were to be, um, yeah, how can you say that? That, that, that were taken, that, that took these fourth oaths of induction were only 60 of the whole Jesuit order at that time. And this oath, the special oath, you can read that in the Library of Congress with number BX3705.S56. I'm not going to read the whole oath to you. I made a video on uh, nothing but the truth. Check my playlist on Juggler 66 that deals for uh, a little bit more than two hours with the reading and examining of the whole oath. But I'm going to read a few very interesting quotes from that oath to you right now. First of all, at the end of page 48, he writes that one part is, I, insert the name of the person who gives the oath right now, who takes the oath right now, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, the Blessed St. Paul and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus. And I stopped the reading right here. We are told by the Bible, by the word of God, not to call anybody on earth our father than the father who is in heaven. And all Catholics refer to the Pope as Holy Father. And the Jesuits refer to the superior general of the Society of Jesus as their ghostly father. This is already something that should make you think. But now I will continue on page 49, and this is still a part of the oath that the Jesuits take, the oath of induction, that will leave absolutely no doubt that from the very inception of the Jesuits in 1540, which this is especially all about, this oath, yes, you will see later, that America was already on that target list. So, I'm going to read this little quote. Listen. Listen closely. Quote, Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine and His Holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretended authority and the churches of England and Scotland and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere and all adherents in regard that they be usurped and heretical opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince or state named Protestants or Liberals, or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. End quote. You have to understand that Ignatius of Loyola and Francis Xavier brought this oath together to convince the Pope at the time to establish the Society of Jesus. The normal three vows of chastity and poverty and obedience were not enough. They needed a fourth oath that goes back to the same kind of oath that the Knights Templars took. That is also why you can call the Jesuits the revived Knights Templars. And as I just read to you, quote, and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere. Remember, we are speaking about 1539. This is about 40 years after the discovering, so-called discovering, of the continent of America. And there already, they include in their oath that they make it their goal to fight the Lutheran Church that 
at that time already established in America. Because America, the continent of America, was called over here in Europe, where I live, the New World. It was a new world because the people who came out of the old world and went into the new world did so because they were suppressed. They were suppressed in the Dark Ages by the Pope. And the starting of the Reformation set the people free and gave them the possibility to settle in a country that was not, between brackets, yet controlled by the Pope who calls himself the king of the earth, or the placeholder of the king of the earth. And the king of the earth, according to the Roman Catholic Church, well, that's Satan. We all know that. And the Pope is just the vicar of Satan here. So already in the starting, in the, in the oath that they brought before Paul III, the Pope, you can see that America was mentioned, and it was absolutely their goal to extirpate all Protestants also on the continent of America. Now, the oath continues for a few more lines on page 49 and on page 50. But the very important thing is that Ignatius wrote this oath and read it to Pope Paul III. And when Ignatius concluded his presentation, this is something that you can read on page 51 of Rulers of Evil, when Ignatius concluded his presentation, the Pope reportedly cried out, Hoc est digitus Dei. Hoc est digitus Dei. This is the finger stroke of God. On September 27, 1540, Paul III sealed his approval with the highest and most solemn form of papal pronouncement, a document known as a bull. Paul's bull, ordaining the Jesuits, is entitled Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, which means in English, on the supremacy of the church militant. The title forms a Kabbalistic device common to pagan Roman divining. Known as Notarigon, this device is an acronym that enhances the meaning of its initialized words in the way M-A-D-D -D tells us that mothers against drunk drivers, M-A-D-D, -D, are more than against drunk drivers. They're very angry. Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae produces the notericon R, between brackets O, M-E, R-M-E, the empire, Rome, whose salvation, the Society of Jesus, was ordained by this bull to secure through the arts of war. Well, Walt, is there anything that you have to say to this very, I think, very important part of the book Rulers of Evil here? Well, in other words, it, it for Americans in the world, uh, in the history that's been told to us, um, it's right in the oath of the Jesuits. And it's, it's prevalent to today because we have a Jesuit pope and a Jesuit pope to come to speak to, uh, to promote his, his in climate encyclical on September 23rd of 2015. So it's, it's, it's come to fruition. It's come to pass. Okay, then I will just continue now and start reading um, the chapter The Jesuits in History from the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. And uh, just let me know when you fill in and have a comment on that on my reading, okay? The true church of the Lord Jesus Christ has suffered reproach and endured persecution in every age since Stephen was martyred. In the early years of the church, to confess Christ invited persecution and martyrdom. Augustine was one of the first, but certainly not the last, to advocate the necessity of force to extirpate error. Error means the true church of Lord Jesus Christ. As Farrar points out, quote, his writings became the Bible of the Inquisition, unquote. So, from then on, inquisitorial methods became part and parcel of Rome's intrigues, all through, uh, although stridently denied by some contemporary writers. 
Martin Luther was used of God to set forth the liberating doctrine of justification by faith in the finished work of Christ and so dealt a death blow to the Roman Catholicism. For this great biblical doctrine destroys completely the whole sacramentarian good works priestly enterprise known as Roman Catholicism. Since the time of Luther, the Roman institution has been working day and night to overthrow Bible Protestantism and return the separated brethren to the one true fold, the Vatican. No greater effort has been made than that made by the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus, founded by Loyola, has been at the origin of many conspiracies directed against Protestantism. They are documented conspiracies, not figments. Figments? Is that the right word? Isn't that fragments? Whatever. Not figments of an overactive imagination. Yeah, Walt? That, that's right. You pronounced it right. Ah, okay. Of an overactive imagination. So it is nothing short of amazing when Gary Allen, who claims to be an authority in the field of conspiracy, calls in Pedro Arupe to, to, to substantiate his thesis that the conspiracy exists. At the time that Allen wrote 10 years ago, Pedro Arupe was head of the Jesuits. And here's a quote from his book, Non Dare Call It Conspiracy, from Gary Allen. Quote, There are also religious leaders who are aware of the existence of this conspiracy. In a UPI story dated December 27, 1965, Father Pedro Arupe, head of the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church, made the following charges during his remarks to the Ecumenical Council. Quote, This, point, 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 godless society operates in an extremely efficient manner, at least in its higher levels of leadership. It makes use of every possible means at its disposal, be they scientific, technical, social, or economic. It follows a perfectly mapped out strategy. It holds almost complete sway in international organizations, in financial circles, in the field of mass communications, press, cinema, radio, and television. End of quote. So even here in this, what I've just read to you, you can see that the Jesuits were from, the, uh, from their inception made against uh, the United States of America, against Protestantism. So America or the colonies stood for Protestantism, and that's what they went against. Please, Walt, your comment. <clears throat> I just want to make sure that the people that are listening, just listen to this, when he, the quote that he read, starting with, this godless society operates in an extremely efficient manner, is a quote from, the, from Pedro Arupi, a black pope. And Gary Allen is writing a book on conspiracies. Gary Allen is writing a book similar to Tex Mars books, or, or the many, many books that have been, been written about conspiracy. And it's the bankers, it's the Rothschilds, it's the Jews. Pedro Arupi is defining what a conspiracy is. A black pope, Gary Allen, used this in none dare call it conspiracy. When people when you see when you see this, it startles you that they have enough uh, let's see if I can get the right word for this. They have enough. They're so bold to be able to, I mean, to come out and right out in the open and 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 talk about conspiracy when they're the biggest, it, it, they're, they're the, the, the most diabolical organization on the face of the earth. This is why, and what, what happens here? What, what happened here? What is they were taking the word Jesuit and making it legitimate. The black pope is legitimate. Oh, this even after I've read this book, I had that explained to me a couple times. I had to share this with some brothers. Am I reading this right? And I, years ago, back in 1992, this was a very popular book, Non-Dare Call It Conspiracy. 
it was a very popular book in the circles of, you might say, the Alex Jones mentality. This is, this is, this is what this is, is they talk and they talk, and the word Jesuit is not in their vocabulary. It's like calling the kettle black, the, or the kettle calling the kettle black. Or it, you know, it's 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 uh, it's mind-boggling. The pot see, calling the kettle black. The pot calling the kettle black. That's exactly what what what's happening here. And so I just want to make sure that the readers, uh, especially people that are, and most of the listeners that are listening to this broadcast, are people that are doing research. You know. And and this is this is this this statement here attracted me to this book. To to to, to I mean this is what may, I mean this this is the the key point in this whole book as how they cover themselves. How they, in other words, if you want to plant a tree, you plant it in the forest. And here here this here the black pope is being quoted from somebody that's trying to expose the bankers. So anyway, that's my end of my comment. Okay, then I'm going to continue reading now. In, uh, in the book on page 11. The Jesuits are famous in history for their conspiracies, intrigues, assassinations, and the undying hatred of the Protestant Reformation. Pedro Arupe was the head of an organization which every well-informed Protestant knows was the main force behind the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation sought by every means, fair or soul, to overthrow and undo the work of the glorious Protestant Reformation. And to get a confirmation of that, just read the completed oath of induction and you will see that if there were no other reason to be against the jesuits but this that they attempted wherever possible to stop or hinder the true work of revival and gospel enlightenment in the church it would be more than enough but there are many more reasons than this so for anyone claiming to be knowledgeable in the field of conspiracy to align himself with the head of the jesuits is a severe blow to say the least to his credibility. Yet thousands of fundamental and conservative preachers speak constantly about Allen's insider conspiracy without once stopping to consider the work of the Jesuits and their sponsor, the Vatican. The Jesuits were so evil that they were feared even by Roman Catholic kings. Macpherson notes, quote, the Roman Catholic king of Portugal says, it cannot be put that the licentious introduced by the Jesuits, of which the three leading features are falsehood, murder, and perjury, deprive the laws of their power, destroy the submission of subjects, allow individuals the liberty of killing, calumniating, lying, and forswearing themselves as their advantage may dictate." End quote. And McKinley adds his testimony to that of Macpherson. Quote, this society, which has dared to appropriate to itself the name which is above every name by calling itself, quote, the order of Jesus, unquote, deserved rather from the, uh, from the nature of its doctrines and from the work it has done in the world to be called the order of Satan, unquote. Even the secular historian W.E. Lund whose text was used for, uh, for years in American colleges and universities, recognized the conspiracies of the Jesuits. Quote, In this development, the English Catholics had no small part. They were not a serious political menace until 1580, when two Jesuits came to England and began to plot with the Spanish ambassador to place Mary on the throne. From that time, Catholic plots were continually being hatched. Some had, uh, some had as their method a rebellion aided by foreign invasion, while others sought their object by the simple mode of Elizabeth's assassination. None of the plots succeeded. Walsingham laid bare the plots and arrested several of the conspirators. End quote. 
So I think we are talking about the Spanish Armada for one thing here, right? That tried to attack Protestant England at that time, mm -hmm. and the Spanish were 100% Catholic controlled. That's right. They were they were in. That's just before just before uh, uh, they they uh, executed Mary Queen of Scots. So continue now. The Jesuits actually became so powerful and overbearing that they were disbanded by none other than the Pope himself. In 1773, Ganganelli, who succeeded Clement XIII, issued a papal bull in which he declared them suppressed and extinct and their statues annulled. They remained suppressed for 40 years, but in 1814, Pope Pius VII issued a bull solemnly re-establishing the society under the constitutions of St. Ignatius. I just want to take a little break here. We all know that the popes are being declared infallible. And when the pope sends out a bull, which is the strongest paper a pope can issue, it is made canon law. And by that it is irreversible. And still... Pope Pius VII, in 1814, brought out a bull that made the former bull from Clement XIII of 1773 obsolete. How can that be? If the Pope is infallible and does in these matters always speak the truth and can be judged by no one and cannot fail, that's why he's infallible, how can then another pope come and put that bull aside? If you do not see the contradiction in these doings here, then I can't help you. But if you see that, then you see that the whole Roman Catholic system is based on a tower of lies. Biggest show on earth. Absolutely. It starts already when you go back with the donations of Constantine and the pseudo Isidorial, uh, Isidorial um, uh, what was that called? Um, uh, I don't know anymore. Uh, Tom made a, a broadcast about that when he read uh, when he read the, the book of uh, Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast. Uh, the Isidorial de Decretals, the pseudo Isidorial Decretals, and the donation of Constantine. Study the donation of Constantine, just type it in, in any search engine uh, on the internet, and you will see that even the Roman Catholic Church, even in their own writings, in their own encyclopedias and all, admit that the donation of Constantine was a forged document. A forged document. And that is the document that gave the Pope the temporal power over the papal states, what today is called most of the time Italy, these places. It's all based on a lie. And the Roman Catholic Church even itself admits it. And still they go on and continue on that. It's all a pile of lies. And of course it is. Because the dragon gave him power and authority. The dragon is Satan. And Satan is the father of all lies. One minute. And you can read that in the Bible. Don't believe me, but Jesus says that in the Bible himself. Yeah, Walt. We got a minute in this in this segment of the broadcast. Okay, then I'm not going to continue reading right now, but I want to reflect uh, to tell the people, go and get the download of the book Rulers of Evil. Go to my YouTube channel, Jogla66. I have a playlist made where the videos are in there where I do the reading. Uh, everyone three quarters of an hour long and then you can go into the description box and there is a link that you can download the book and read everything that I just stated here for yourself. The fact that the society was held in such disrepute even by its own institution is certainly not much of a recommendation for its evil practices. Yet the man who headed this society when Gary Allen wrote this book, Non Dare Call It Conspiracy, was called in by Allen to Coralbound corroborate the fact that an international conspiracy exists. It is obvious that it is very easy to postulate a Bilderberger 
insider or trilateralist, meaning from the Trilateral Commission, type of conspiracy without generating any animosity among the general public. Everyone and anyone can identify against a few rich evil men lurking in the shadows and working to take over the world. But to identify religious men as conspirators causes millions of people to bridle in anger and disbelief. It is obvious that very few people know anything about the Jesuits today. Let us look at the organization that Ignatius of Loyola brought into being. There were several steps through which every well-trained Jesuit was to pass before he was graduated from his training. First, the spiritual exercises. These were undertaken with the object of inducing, among other things, a state of complete subjection of the will. Secondly, if the trainee passed the first test, he was invited to become a novice. From this time on, he is excluded from all earthly friends and is to have no will of his own as to his future. He is to put himself in the hands of his director as the interpreter of heaven taught him. Complete obedience is the thing that is absolutely required. His conscience must never assert itself in opposition to his superiors. Newman notes, quote, absolute destruction of individual will and conscience is aimed at and to a great extent accomplished, end quote. Can anyone imagine a better base upon which to build a global conspiracy than complete and unquestioning obedience? And every small conspiracy about which details can be studied, one of the primary goals is to get each conspirator to give his unquestioning and complete obedience to the plan. The novitiate usually lasts two years. Uh, no, novitiate, sorry, lasts two years. If the novice is found to possess the right qualities, he is accepted as a scholar. Notice the weeding out process that continues all through the entire program. Only the most dedicated make it through to the final stages of the society. The scholar now undergoes a protracted course of training in various branches of knowledge. Attention is paid to the cultivation of a sound physical makeup. If the scholar is able to meet the requirements of this stage, he becomes a coadjutor. Those who attain this rank are to devote themselves wholeheartedly to the advancement of the society. They serve as priests, missionaries, teachers, and businessmen for the society. The next rung on the ecclesiastical ladder is a group called the professed. These are composed of a small proportion of the coadjutors who have proved themselves and have been tested as to their complete trustworthiness regarding the aims of the society. It is from this group the officers of the society are drawn. The officers of the society are drawn. Understand this well. We are still dealing with Ecclesia Militante, with a militant church. So, the officers are drawn from this group. They are the ones who are entrusted with its secrets. Watch care is another important part of the society. Each member, including the general, is responsible to another, and according to Newman, quote, to whom he most regularly make confession of his inmost thoughts, and who is required to exercise a watch care over him and to report every deviation from rectitude according to the standards of the body. Unquote. The aim of the order was, according to Ignatius, the promotion of the greater glory of God. According to Newman, quote, the greater glory of God was identified by them in the most absolute way with the worldwide and undisputed dominion of the Roman Catholic Church. Unquote. The methods of the order are well known. In most cases, the Jesuits deny the charges against them. But it has been charged that they infiltrate into places of power using as their watchword the phrase, quote unquote, the end justifies the means. The fact that they deny such actions should not cause any surprise since that is part and parcel of their method of operation. Their ethical system allows all kinds of loopholes by which to escape any situation that might cause embarrassment to the society or to the Roman Catholic Church. The society did openly defend their recommendation that tyrants should be assassinated. 
Their doctrine of probabilism, although rejected by some members, nevertheless secured papal recognition. Their ability to escape responsibility by the method of, quote, directing the intention, unquote, also demonstrates that the phrase, quote, the end justifies the means, unquote, although never appearing in their writings, is there in their purpose as plain as day. Um, well, it never appears in their writings is not true because it, is, uh, it appears in the oath, the end justifies the means, that at the end the church may be the gainer of all actions of the society of Jesus. Another equally objectionable doctrine was their teaching on mental reservation or restriction, whereby one, without burden to his conscience, might tell a downright lie, provided the word or clause that would make it true in his mind. Thus, one accused of having com uh, committed a certain act last week in a certain place may swear that he was not there, reserving the statement, quote, this morning, the secret uh, this morning, unquote. The secret instructions supposed to be the frank directions of the generals to the provincials and other involving in scrupulous commands can no longer be used. The genuineness of the document has been denied by the society. It was first published in 1612 and, if not genuine, was probably the production of the ex-Jesuit Hieronymus Zorokovsky. However, as Newman Cogently reasons, quote, the repudiation of the work by the society is, of course, no conclusive evidence of its spurious. I'm sorry, I have a problem with this word here. <laughs> spuriousness. Uh, it has been the consistent policy of the society from the beginning to deny everything disadvantages to the church or to itself, unquote. The supreme end, as noted above, was the greater glory of God. So any superior can declare an end, however diabolical, to involve the greater glory of God and command his inferior to use any means whatever for the accomplishment of this end, including, as Newman points out, quote, deceit, theft, and even murder, and the inferior must unquestioningly obey, unquote. Hutch also points out in his work the notoriety which the Jesuits attained through their principle of mental reservation. Quote, the doctrine that the character of an act depended solely on the intention. If the intention be good, the act is good. Whether it be falsehood, perjury, murder, or any other conceivable crime. Pascal quotes the Jesuits' moralist Escobar as lying down on the general principle, quote, that promises are not binding unless there was an intention of keeping them at the time they were made, unquote. On the same principle that the intention determines the character of the act, the murder of Henry III in 1589, of the Prince of Orange in 1584, of Henry IV of France in 1610, and especially, yes, especially the massacres on the Feast of St. Bartholomew were all justified, unquote. Gordon Liddy, who was also educated by the Jesuits, used the same type of reasoning for justifying his part in the Nixon-Watergate scandal. It is very significant that Liddy, who now claims he does not believe in God, nevertheless uses the various definitions of the Roman moralists to justify murder. Quote, it is the same rationale by which I was willing to obey an order to kill Jack Anderson. But I would do so only after satisfying myself that it was A, an order from a legitimate authority, B, a question or malum prohibitum, and C, a rational response to the problem. Unquote. Once we allow the reasoning of the Jesuits to prevail, then murder becomes a viable means of policy if we feel that it is necessary. It is tragic that many fundamental and evangelical Christians agree with this type of reasoning today, showing that Jesuitical casuistry has made vast strides since the 16th century. We believe in capital punishment. We do not believe, however, 
that any man has the right to be judge, jury, and executioner. Once allow this type of thinking, and Thomas Torquemada and the Inquisition will not be far away. The Jesuits were well received in Italy and in Portugal at first. However, in Spain, Charles V was opposed to their methods and to their ideas of papal absolutism. Leading Roman Catholic Spanish theologians, such as Melchior Canos, denounced them as the forerunners of Antichrist, foretold by the Apostle in 2 Timothy 3, verse 2. In France, they met with opposition, but finally gained a foothold and permission to establish a college at Clermont. In Lyon, their presence and teaching resulted in the burning of the books and churches of the Huguenots. It is probable that the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day was due in some measure uh, to their influence. In England, Trevelyan says of the Jesuits that their policy aimed, quote, at the overthrow of the existing regime and the forcible extirpation of Protestantism, end quote. A likelier group to originate a global conspiracy would indeed be difficult to find. Their zeal knew no bounds. They were and are the heart and soul of the Counter-Reformation. As Newman, the great Southern Baptist historian, points out, quote, The chief means that were used by the Counter-Reformation from this time onward, 1541, were the Council of Trent, the Society of Jesus and the Inquisition. These means of uh, fortifying the Church and repressing heresy are closely interlinked. The Council of Trent, especially in its later and more important phases, and the establishment and working of the Inquisition, like the policy of the papacy in general, were due to Jesuit influence. Well, there's one interesting point that I want to make uh, by, again, going back to rulers of evil. The last paragraph on page 52, also in chapter 7, the fingerstroke of God, which I read before, reads as follows. Listen very carefully. Within two years of Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, so that means after 1540, the reading of the dose, Paul III appointed the society to administer the Roman Inquisition, not to be confused with the Spanish Inquisition, which reported only to the Spanish crown. When the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, Listen, when the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, Pope Paul III made his move to reconcile with the Protestants. End quote. This is heavy. You have any, th any thoughts on this, world? Isn't this a very heavy paragraph? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It, uh, I mean... Uh... When you have all the your ducks in a row, it's real simple now. Uh, when we fast forward to 2015 to see where they're going. Yeah, I wouldn't see it now in the in the light of 2015. This is only the continuation of the counter reformation. Continuation of the counter reformation. But, but, but here we are speaking about the the roots of the counter reformation. I mean, when the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, so it was proposed to them that they could do whatever they want and you just heard in their oaths at least partly what they are all willing to do against anybody who is against them and when they were comfortable with the inquisition paul made his move to reconcile with the protestants and what was his move to reconcile with the protestants that was the council of trent that was the council of trent that we are just speaking about here you know, from the, little, um, from the little paragraph that I just read here from uh, Newman, the chief means that were used by the Counter-Reformation from this time on, what, 1541, were the Council of Trent, the Society of Jesus and the Inquisition. This goes 100%. This backs absolutely up what Tapasosi wrote in his book, And Rulers of Evil. So you see, when you read one book and you read another book, you can even see how they two come together. And then you can see this is not just a novel or whatever, but this is really based on facts, on people who did their research. 
Right. And here you can really see how the Counter-Reformation started, by founding the Jesuits and by giving them the authority over the Inquisition. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you don't know what the Inquisition was all about, and you will be shocked. Any more comment, Walt? Otherwise, I continue reading. No, no comment. Okay. So for someone to call the black, uh, in the Black Pope, Pedro Arupe, to comment on, this, uh, on the possible existence of a conspiracy, is like calling Adolf Hitler to comment on the possible existence of Nazism. <laughs> nice comparison. It is better to go with known facts about conspiracy than to hint at hidden conspiracies which may not even exist. The Jesuits were indefatig indefatigable in their efforts to restore Romanism to its former glory and in the areas where Protestantism had gained a foothold. Von Ranke tells of the return of the idolatry of Romanism to parts of Germany. Quote, In Cologne, it was, a, uh, it was again an honor to wear the rosary. Relics were once more held up to public reverence in Treves, that's Trier in Germany, Treves, um, where for many years no one had ventured to exhibit them. The youth of Ingolstadt, belonging to the Jesuit school, walked on a pilgrimage in order to be strengthened for their confirmation by the dew that stopped them from the tomb of St. Walpurgis. St. Walpurgis, that's um, a pagan uh, reference they do there. The Jesuits were the first effective counteraction against the progress of Protestantism that the Roman Catholic Church was able to wage. Yet few Protestants then and now fail to realize the eternal issue which are at stake at this battle, issues that are at stake at this battle. Grace and idolatrous works and mutually ex are mutually exclusive. Error is only defeated by the proclamation of the truth. It is never defeated by compromise, half-truths, or a failure to recognize its existence. And this completes the chapter on the Jesuits in history. To my opinion, it was quite an interesting little journey to go over parts of chapter 7 of Rulers of Evil and this, because these two parts you could read, or you could understand probably, they're very much in... Um, in agreement with each other. Yes, by two different authors, two different researchers. Yeah, absolutely. With absolutely two, two different backgrounds, everything. Yeah. So, um, do you want to continue on the Jesuits in uh, uh, today? Yes. Or would, you, or would you rather say we should save that for another broadcast? Because I know that you have a video that you want to play for the intro. Well, well I, you know, we, we can play that. I, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I think that it fits, it fits real. Uh, it fits to play it just before we start the Jesuits today. Okay. Okay. okay so before me... we continue with the Jesuits today, you will now hear a little recording that Walt is going to play to you, and then we will continue in the book. This, this is uh, John Boehner on February 5th of 2015. A bit of good news. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, that day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, we're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. Okay, I, I think... This this is real appropriate right now, you know, to look at this from a child of God's perspective and from a, a Roman Catholic perspective. And uh, I think he, uh, I would like to I like to play. Um, uh, this, this is Mr. One President. Final question, yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict the Sixteenth's eyes, what do you see? God. When you look into Benedict the Sixteenth's eyes, what do you see? God. Good way to end the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. That. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> so. Um, 
looking from a Catholic perspective, uh, with the Pope coming to speak, uh, it can be said, it can be said, you know, that uh, God is coming to speak to the to the Congress on t- September 23rd. But from a child of God's perspective, it's, uh, you know, I, I would have to say this to you, John Vayner. He is uh, not holy to me, and he's not my father. And his fa- in, in his fact that you, uh, in behalf of the American people, I think what you're saying, Mr. Vayner, is you're saying that... Uh, in behalf of the Roman Catholic Church, I think that's what you, how, how that's the right perspective, uh, Mr. Boehner. But uh, as an American, I have to give you a little history, Mr. Boehner. Uh, back in 1776, <clears throat> uh, you weren't even allowed to uh, hold civil ser- civil office, or you weren't uh, didn't have religious liberty. But because of 1776, you have religious liberty, and uh, I see. I don't see a separation of church and state here. We have. Uh, we have. Uh, your God is coming to speak. And uh, but what is the? What was the God? founded this country, what was the God that before 1776? Before 1776, here are some of the, here's some, some quotes. Here's Roger Williams. This is, this is what Roger Williams thought about the Roman Catholic Church. He said, he, he, he spoke of the Pope as the pretender, pretended vicar of Christ on earth, who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but after the souls and consciences of all his vassals, yea, over the Spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself. Speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. John Wesley said, the Methodist, speaking of the papacy, he said, he is emph- emphatically sense. He is emphatically sense the man of sin, as he increases all matter of sin above measure, and he is to properly style the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of n- numberless multitudes, both of his op- opposers and followers. He it is that exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, claiming the highest power and the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone, taken from Antichrist and his ten kings by John Wesley. <clears throat> Thomas Cramer, Cramer, quote, Whereof it followeth Rome to the seat of Antichrist and to the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers and strong reasons. Taken from the works from Kramer in volume 1, page 6, 6 and, six and 7. It, you know, uh, and this is a quote from... Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the superstition of Rome is the worst of all the evils which have befallen our race. May the Lord arise and sweep it down to hell from whence it arose. Now that is the perspectives and the views of godly men before 1776. But 1776 give us was religious freedom for Roman Catholics and civil power. And Mr. Boehner, 
That's why you're the Speaker of the House today. It's because of the American Revolution. Because prior to the American Revolution, all 13 colonies had state constitutions. And right in their constitution, they told us that no Protestants could hold office. So that's what it means to a biblical Christian. And see, I say this to the listeners. No Catholics, Walt. No yes. Catholics could hold office, not no Protestants. It, it, excuse me. Yes, excuse me. No Catholics could hold office. It was, it was uh, right in the Constitution that the Protestants were the only ones that could. You had to be a Protestant to hold an office. Now this is, and what we just read in the in the past chapter, <clears throat> the history of the Jesuits, and I think, uh, I think Ronald Cook made it very evident, and then uh, what, uh, and Tupper Saucy, another researcher, gives us the same. When you look at history in the Dark Ages, in the Inquisition, we know where it came from. So it's very, very significant what's happening here on September 23rd of 2015. We have a Jesuit. This chapter that we're starting is called the Jesuits Today. The Jesuits Today are bringing a Jesuit Pope to speak to a joint session of Congress. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ... We don't have a spirit of fear. Now you can, I've I have in another broadcast mentioned thud. That's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You see, this visit from the Pope, the Pope coming over here, a Jesuit Pope, is we're not full of fear. God will take care of us, but what it shows us is the times we live in. And you have to know your adversary. And now, now we, have, we can understand, because I'll tell you, I can almost tell you verbatim what he's going to speak about. He's written, they've written a, a climate uh, encyclical. They're going to use global warming to to uh, to to step into world taxes and and uh, the carbon taxes, they're going to use they're going to go from there to finance to economics to the economy to establish their one world government. So, listeners, this little booklet it's got 126 pages, and the cover the back cover and the front cover. The back cover is the Inquisition in America shows two popes that were put up as busts. As you walk into the Speaker of the House, these famous lawgivers, historic figures noted for their work in establishing the principles that underline American law. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why do we have two of the most ruthless popes in history in the House of Representatives? Well, you know, we have to take the red pill now, okay? This country, this country was founded by the Jesuits. This world is Catholic. And, and so I think this is a, a, a good inter, introduction to, and we even had an American president, I just played it to you, that said when he looks into the eyes of the Pope, he sees God. That is where we're at in 2015. And remember, which God does he see? As you know, that George W. Bush was a Bones man. And Skull and Bones is a Freemasonic order. And the Freemasons have a god that is Lucifer. 
But that's, of course, nothing that he wants to tell you, you know? No, no. And but the point being, when he says he sees God, that's why he sees Satan. He does see his God. But you, you have to understand this also. This is not told to the public, of course. This is esoteric knowledge, not exoteric knowledge. Therefore, you have to study Freemasonry. To understand that when they say this, they mean, I see Lucifer. And there, Luciferian religion. And that is not the God of the Bible, is it? No. But of course, everybody thinks, oh, he means the God of the Bible. No, he does not. He means his God. You know, it's, it's, it's the reason why those three emails kind of boosted, you know, boosted my morale a little bit, the, the encouragement that I got from them. Because, you know, you know, I'll tell you, what are we going to do? Are we going to turn our backs and say, well, you know, or, you know, because the world right now, you're not hearing about the Pope coming here in, in September. It's not in the news. The people out in the streets, they don't know the Pope's coming. It's just a few on the Internet. Alex Jones is not talking about it. The Hagmans are not talking about it. The alternative media is not talking about it. And the mass media is not talking about it. Because they know. They know. I mean, that's the power, the power of the press. And now you understand when I see the school buses go by in the mornings, those children getting on those buses are not learning any education. They're not getting any education. They're not getting... They were... Because Mr... If I was talking to Mr. Boehner, you see, Mr. Boehner, my heritage for... I'm 71 years old, uh, John, and and I didn't really know my culture or my heritage because I was never taught it. I was given football games and basketball games and Hollywood, Hollywood, and, and I was kept busy. But my heritage, my heritage, our heritage as children of God, as a child of God, our heritage as Americans came prior to 1776. Those 13 colonies were were. They risked their life to come over here. The, 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 the survivors, they were, they were Protestants. They were Protestants. And when 1776 came by, that's why we have all this immigration and why we're being invaded from the, from the South. How did the Catholics gain their power and this and that uh, now uh, York is just he's read on two different occasions and I read it again and and it really sticks home you see when you read the first chapter of of, of Tupper Saucy's book Subliminal Rome he quotes all the different departments of health you know Health, welfare, all the different sub subtitles. Every single committee and subcommittee, every single one is chaired by a Catholic layperson. You want me to read them for our listeners here? Uh, yeah, I think it would be a good time to read them. Yeah, you know, this is taken from. Uh, the 1992, <clears throat> sorry, the 1992 World Almanac of U.S. Politics that was not directly controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. The committees on subcommittees of the United States Senate and House of Representatives governing commerce, communications and telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection finance and financial institutions, transportation, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, 
oversight of the Federal Reserve System, commodity prices, rent services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic trade, oceans, environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures, including wage and price controls. Why do you need wage and price controls in a capitalistic and so-called free market society? Gold and precious metals trend actions, agriculture, animal and forestry industries, rural issues, nutrition, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprise, environment and pollution, appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines drug labeling and packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharine, national health insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped and aging. In other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in America came under the chairmanship of one of these Roman Catholic laypersons. Now, I'm going to read to you only a few of the names that Tapasosi states here in this book. One of the most interesting names in here is Joseph Biden, who is today the vice president and the real power behind the puppet Obama, and John Kerry, also like George W. Bush, a skull and bones man, and who is today, 2015, Secretary of State of the United States of America. And among others, we also find Edward Kennedy and a lot of other people. But for that, you can read the book yourself. This is taken from Rulers of Evil, Chapter 1, Page 3 in the book, when it starts. There is really nothing that the Roman Catholic Church left out to control in America. All these just four named um, uh, subjects, soil conservation and, and so forth, uh, everything that I just read, came under the chairmanship of one of these then listed Roman Catholic laypersons, all Roman Catholic. You know, it's the same like when you go today to the United States Supreme Court. You will not find one protestant on the United States Supreme Court but you will find six Catholics and three Jews. Now, at first you might say, what's that important for? The Supreme Court. <clears throat> I don't know what they do. Well, that's the big problem then that you have, that you don't know what they do. Because the United States Supreme Court is there to interpret the Constitution. Now, what do you think the Constitution is worth when it is being interpreted by six Roman Catholics and three Jews, and not one Protestant. And one thing, too, they might be six Catholics and three Jews, but they're all liberal. They're all the same. They have a liberal agenda, and evidence doesn't matter. Uh, it's postmodernism, but remember, I want to end this and, and the, uh, note. I mean, it's kind of sour. You know, it kind of what's the word? It uh, it's kind of alarming when you start to really see what's going on. Now you don't have to yell Jews, and you understand that we live in a Catholic world, and the world battle was going on in the First Reich the Holy Roman Empire. You look at the First, Second World War, all the wars, Hollywood, or uh, in uh, Vietnam. How many, how many, especially, and how many movies do you ever see come out of Hollywood? They're 
that are not or that are against Romanism. You don't. But how many you come out of Hollywood that make the pr- Protestant minister uh, uh, you know, a bigot? What about the movie? What about the series Archie, Archie Bunker? Archie Bunker was posing as a as a Protestant. You know, he was considered a religious bigot but not the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, this is what we're seeing. What we have what we have coming on September 23rd, we have the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. The dragon is coming to speak. And his he's they you know, these climate they've got a climate covenant. You know, some of the things that Obama, I just read some things of what Obama said at the graduation of the Coast Guard Academy. They're going to use this global warming, and it's nothing but a fraud. Global warming is a joke. It's been and, disproved. And it's based on evolution and not it's, on creation. It's based on evolution, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, it's you know, in well anyway we have getting down to the we got about another minute, so yeah I know we have to come to an end here. I just I just want to read Luke twenty one verse twenty four from the King James Bible to all the people who think that we are living in a Jewish conspiracy to all the idiots out there who think that the Zionists the Zionist Jews are behind this. Zionism has been founded, by the way, by the Jesuits, and you can search that up for yourself. But in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, from the King James Bible, it says, quote, And they shall, fall, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. End quote. We are living in the times of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are the other nations than Israel, all the other nations, the so-called godless nations, that have been brought the gospel after Jesus' crucifixion. First, the gospel was meant to be brought to the Jews. The Jews rejected it, and then it was brought to the Gentiles, and we are living now in the time of the Gentiles. So far, to all you people who think we are living in a Jewish conspiracy, the Jews don't run anything. They are just frontmen for the Jesuit, for the diverse Jesuit organizations. They said I second. So we're going to conclude our broadcast for today, the 28th of May 2015, and we will continue next week with the reading of the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy and uh, Chapter 2 of that book, The Jesuits Today. I thank you, Walt, for contributing to this broadcast. I wish you all a nice day and a nice week. Until the next time, God bless you and bye-bye.